we grow in discipleship with people in our life when we begin to let people in and that's why we emphasize relationships here what are we going to do to grow in discipleship what are we going to do when people come in to help them grow well we've been in a series and we've been talking about discipleship Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not only is it to make disciples, but making disciples and teaching them to obey. And when we look at discipleship today, if you would say, what does discipleship mean? Because maybe you've heard the word, but what does it mean? And how we're defining discipleship is simply the process of developing a person to think and act like Jesus. You know, a couple of years ago, there were those bracelets and those signs, and you might have seen the acronym, right? WWJD. What would Jesus do? do. Maybe even some of you wore that. And the whole thought behind it was every time you had to make a decision or, or something was going crazy in your life, you're supposed to look at that and think, what would Jesus do? And some of you thought Jesus would scream, right? He has, I don't know, right? You look at that. Ah, I don't care. But here, here's the point was it was how do we behave more like Jesus? And I th always thought that was a great thing. Did I always follow it? No, not really. But we're trying. And here's the thing. We're on a journey. We're all on a journey. We're all growing. We're all at different stages in our walk with the Lord. Isn't that true? Uh, some you may have for years. For some, it's just beginning. Uh, here, here's the thing. It's not about where you are. It's where are you heading? Are you moving in that direction? It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we don't mess up. Hopefully, when we fall, fall forward. Keep getting up, keep moving forward in our life. And discipleship is that we're on that growth to be more like Jesus, to think more like Jesus, to act like Jesus. And when I think about discipleship, true discipleship is when it's not just you and Jesus, but when you invite someone else on the journey with you. When you're growing in discipleship together, I heard someone talking about this. There are four aspects in our lives, four different areas in our life. The first would be the arena. The arena is the grand showcase. It's the arena that everyone sees. You know, for a lot of you here, it's the arena. We see your life. We may not know what's going on in your life, but in the arena, in the grand arena, uh, you're able to fool everyone. It, it can look good. It can look okay. Uh, it's just that thing. So people see that. They don't know you. They see you. They might think, wow, they, they look like they have it all together. And then you get the second area of our lives, and that's the mask. So the mask is, I know, but you don't. And we put the mask on. Some of you, you you're here in church today, and you have the mask on, Right? You're smiling, you look happy, but you were just screaming at each other in the car, or you're yelling at your kids in the car. You had an argument this morning, you didn't even get out of bed and you were arguing, but then you come to church, you put the mask on, and you're like, we're great, we're great. How you doing? It's all good, praise the Lord, God is good. I'm on top and I'm rising, going forward, not going back. And your spouse is next to you, like, yeah, right. I think we've all been there. Okay, I've been coming to church my whole life. Do you think I'm always happy when I come up to preach? No, sometimes I got the mask on. But when she's in the front row, she doesn't need the mask. She can give me the stink eye. You can't see it, but she looks at me. We have the mask. I know, but you don't know. And then here's the third part, a part of our life. It's the blind spots. So what's the blind spots is you know but I don't know, right? I, I think of the blind spot as kind of like the spinach in your teeth. <laughs> you ever talk to someone and there's something in your teeth, in their teeth, and all you can do is look at their teeth, right? Um, you know they have no idea. They can't see. And we have those areas in our life that other people can see, but we miss it. We just can't see. We're too close to it, and we can't see 
And then the fourth area, I love this area of our life, it's the potential. And it's the area that only God knows. At times, we don't even know what we could do. Only God knows. And you have those areas. And how do we grow and develop through those four areas? It's through discipleship. It's through discipleship. And what I want to talk to you today is I'm just simply entitling this the three arenas of discipleship. I look in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. It said the Lord or Jesus now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. What was the number? What was the number? 72. All right, 72 other disciples. Matthew 10, 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. How many? 12. Twelve. All right, you guys are getting better at this. And then we see uh, Jesus not only had the 72, he not only had the 12, but there were the three, Peter, James, and John. These were the three who were with him at the transfiguration on the mountain. These are the three who were with him when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. And the three who were with him when Jesus was in the garden praying before the crucifixion. He didn't take everyone. It was the three, Peter, James, and John. And so I was thinking about this. And I, I see in the life of Jesus, there were the 72. There were the 12. We hear about the 12 the most. And then there were the three. Jesus had... The big group of discipleship, he had a little smaller group of the discipleship, and then there was the most intimate group of discipleship. And in our life, we have those three arenas also. And I, I look at this, and I want to start with number one, the church. Everyone say the church. When we think big picture, where does this begin? It begins in the church. Psalms 84, verse Five. And I want to just uh, jump ahead to verse 10. It says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. You know, what was the psalmist saying? I'd rather stand at the door of the house of the Lord than, than to be in the most opulent settings. I'll do anything. If, if it takes being a doorkeeper, if it takes taking care of the yard, whatever it is that gets me close to God's presence is where I want to be. And I just love the hunger that they had. And I would pray that that would be the hunger that you and I have when we come together and we worship God. I tell you, I love the church. I think about last Sunday, we didn't have church. Can I be honest with you? That threw me off for the whole week. I've seen some people today, it's, I felt like I didn't see you for a year. And I realized I reset, my, my, my life resets. It calibrates on Sunday mornings. You say, is that just because you're a pastor? No, it's because back in 1979, when my dad gave his life to the Lord, my dad made a decision that he was going to be in church every Sunday. He wasn't pastoring. He wasn't on staff. He just made the commitment that I'm going to be in God's house. And from the beginning when he started, how, how that scripture says there, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. My dad probably did everything. He made tapes on the weekend for the church. He did kids ministry. He did nursery. He did whatever it was. He was in the house of the Lord. And what did that mean? It meant that from the time I was three years years old, I was in the house of the Lord. And there was a habit that was established. And we I've been in church for practically my whole life. It's been a part of our up my upbringing. I know for my wife, she not only was in church, she lived in the church 
growing up. And, and she was in church, and we've been in the house of the Lord. We've been planted in the house of the Lord. And there's something powerful when we come together as the body of Christ, when we worship together, when you walk in at times a little discouraged of your week, and you come in and your heart is lifted, when you get recalibrated and you begin to point upward again, rather than looking at our problems, we start looking at the answer to our problems. I love the church. Love the church. <laughs> Jerusalem is situated at 25, around 2,500 feet of elevation. And when you go to Jerusalem, it is an uphill drive. Today it would be a drive. But back in that time, it would have been the pilgrimage when they would have made their way up. They'd have been walking with their animals and with their children, and they're walking up. Which, when you look at the Psalms and you ever read that, the song, the song of ascent. And those would be some of the songs that the pilgrims will be singing as they're trekking uphill. And I remember even just being in the bus as we were driving uphill, I was thinking, man, this is pretty high to get there. And there was a commitment that was made by those people that said, I want to go to the house of the Lord. I'm going to walk up to the house of the Lord. We're, we're going to hike up to the house of the Lord. And I think in America at times, we take church for granted. It's just a little too easy now. And back then, it took some sweat to get to the house of the Lord. Today, you might have people, they don't want to go to church if it's raining. They, they don't want to show up for worship if they can't get their parking stall. I remember back at my dad's church, God bless, bless her heart. You know what that means in church world when you say bless their heart? If you don't, bless your heart. But bless her heart. I still remember the, one, of the, one of the older ladies in my dad's church who stormed off on Sunday morning because somebody was sitting in her chair when she showed up. Her chair. I didn't even see her name on it. Her chair. And I think how often we get a little distracted and we start taking for granted the opportunity that we have to come as the church of Jesus Christ to worship. There are people, if it took serving every Sunday, there are people in other countries that would serve every Sunday if it meant they could have church. There are people in countries that can't do what we do and they would give whatever they had if it meant that they could have a church and worship publicly together. I want to say don't take the church for granted. Don't take the opportunities that we have to worship for granted. It took work, but yet they got to the house of the Lord. And I just love that we have people that love church, people that love serving in church and being generous in church. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Don't, uh, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another now, especially that the day of his return is drawing near. Thank God for online technology and you're watching from wherever you are, but I'll tell you, there's nothing like being being in the room. And I know there's sometimes you can't make it and that's okay, but if you can, get in the house of the Lord. Wherever you're watching from, find a church and get planted with other believers. And I love the fact of what the church does. Psalm 73 says, truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. How many of you almost lost your footing? I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. You ever been at those places in life when you say, God, why is everyone else's life so much better than mine? I'm serving you. I'm faithful. I'm giving. Yet I have all these trials. And look at those wicked people out there. It looks like their life is so good. And this person goes on to say how they began to complain and begin to look at others. But verse 13, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? 
I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. But I love this part. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Can I tell you today, church will bring clarity and perspective to your life. And I believe that the church has everything you need for whatever season of life you're going through. If your marriage is struggling today, get in church. If you're having problems with your kids, get in church. If you're struggling financially, get in church. If you need purpose and healing and you're struggling with unforgiveness, get planted in church. It will bring freedom in your life. When we get together corporately in purpose and mission, believing for more. No church is perfect. How many of you know that Noah's ark stunk? It was filled with animals. But it was the only thing afloat. The church is not perfect. In fact, the church might stink at times, but it's the only thing afloat. Get attached. As long as people are involved, it'll never be perfect. But I thank God that God is perfect and he's continuing to work in our life. And I believe the first step, the first arena when it comes to discipleship, the big entryway is getting planted in a church. We're not the only church, by the way. But getting planted in the church, find a good church. That's so huge. But here we get to the second part, and that's small groups. Small groups get a little smaller. And I look at our church, and we're in an interesting season, a building season. As you know, we're, we're building. We have our, our property, and uh, we're, we're building this church. What's going to happen? You know, you can look historically, whenever a church is completed, it grows in numbers. A building's done. Some of that people are just niele, right? They're just, they've been watching it for years, and they want to come. Some stick, some won't, but people will come. And I've been thinking about it a lot. I don't want to just be satisfied with a bigger church attendance number. We need a bigger discipleship number. See, we can grow in that number, but Jesus didn't say build big churches. He said, grow disciples. Challenge people to be more like me. Nothing wrong with big churches, but are we growing people. And I am thinking about that building, people that are going to come, people that are going to walk into the families that are going to come for the first time. I love walking. I was, I've been taking little Teddy now, if he's a little fussy or even not, I just, I just take my grandson and we'll walk through the building. And I just did that again. And he doesn't make a sound. He just looks around the whole time. I just hold him there. And he just looks with those beady eyes. And he just looks all around. And I'm walking. And I'm just like, Teddy, this is going to be the coffee shop. There's going to be people here. And I'm, I'm walking around the auditorium. I'm like, this is the auditorium. And I go, Teddy, let's look at your room. This is going to be the nursery. This is where you're going to be. And then I go, and when you get bigger, come. And I take him. I'm like, this is going to be the kids' room. And you're going to start in this room. And then you're going to go. And then we go to the other room. Then you're going to be in this room. And we're walking around. And I just feel faith being stirred in my heart. But as we're walking through, even yesterday, I began to think, how are we going to build disciples? And I'll tell you what, I can't do it alone. You're the church. Jesus didn't commission just the pastors to build disciples. He's commissioned you and me. What are we going to do to grow in discipleship? What are we going to do when people come in to help them grow? One of the things we have in our church is small groups. Small groups take us to the next step. And they're starting this week. I encourage people to get into a small group. They just had a young adults meeting yesterday. They had line dancing last night. If you, if you want to line dance, there's a small group for you. You can line dance and talk about Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Um, we've been having a bunch of men's groups that have been meeting, coming out of our men's retreat and women's groups. And, and there's all of these groups. What is so awesome about small groups, it, it allows us to connect at another level. You know, you could come to a church, and I've had people tell me, I left this church, it was just too big. 
Here's the reality. Church is going to be as big as you make it. A rise church will be as big as you make it. You could go to a church of 80 people, and if all you do is walk in for service, and when church is done, you walk out without talking to anyone, that church was too big for you. And what I've recognized in our church, as we grow bigger, we grow smaller. And small groups is a way that we can connect. I read a story, and this was a true story of a party that was happening, and it was in a swimming pool. And the pool was filled with like 30 to 50 people that were swimming in this pool. And there were even lifeguards that were there at the pool. And in that pool filled with people, do you know that there was still someone who drowned? They drowned and they didn't find the body till two to three days later. That body lied there in a pool filled with people. And we can be in church on a Sunday morning. Thank God for church. I love the church. This is where it starts. But you can be in church and you can be surrounded by people and you can still be drowning in your life. Small groups is the opportunity for us to begin to connect at another level. You know, Japan... You think of the nation of Japan, I mean, it is densely populated. There are people whose jobs in the morning in the big city, and I'm not making this up, their job is to stand there and push bodies in the train so the doors can close. That's how tight it is in there. I've been in the train. I got like somebody's head right here. I'm just smelling scalp, you know, and... You're surrounded by people all over, and you're just like, who's touching me? You don't know. You can't even turn around. It's weird at times. And it's that populated, and yet they say Japan is the most antisocial com- country in the world. You can be surrounded by people, and you can be all alone. It's what you make of it. And it's the same thing in the body of Christ. It's what you make of it. And unless you become intentional about friendships and relationships, you're going to miss out on the best part of serving the Lord while we're here on earth, and that's being with people. Being friendly and connecting. Our goal, we're going to grow small as we grow big. Small levels is an, A small group is another level of connection not found on Sunday morning. Why, why do we love small groups? They provide three things for us. They provide connection, they provide connection, and they pr- protection, and they provide growth. We get to connect over shared interests. You get to find people who like the same things as you. Isn't that great? You get to find people that might have kids that are the same age as your kids. Like we said earlier, you'll find people who like line dancing, not me, but you'll find other people. And that's okay. You find people that you are connected with, and you just build that connection, crafting. Maybe you want to have a Bible study. Maybe you want to walk around the park and just talk story. You get to do that, and you find people that share that interest. You begin to build connection, and then we find protection in small groups. You say, why protection? Well, you know, as a pastor, there's no way I can know what's going on in everyone's life. That's just impossible, but you know, your small group can know. People in your group can know. They can pray for you. They can support you. They can hold you accountable. They can uh, pray for you in times of needs. It's your small group. Maybe you haven't shown up for church in a while. Someone from your small group will check in. Hey, how are you doing? We find protection in that group. And then we see the third is growth. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the parts of a body. And do you know that your finger... Everybody, just hold up your finger right now. Everybody hold up your finger. Look at your finger, right? You know that your finger on its own will never find its true potential. If your finger was disconnected from your hand right now, could you imagine, what what could it do other than just wriggle or wiggle on the table, right? That's all it can do. For a finger to know its full potential, it has to be connected to a hand. And a hand, with all of these fingers, it can begin to grab. But for a hand to know its full potential, it has to be connected to an arm. Don't, don't believe what you see on the Adams family. That ha- hand is not that awesome, all right? Hand can do anything. I'm like, every time I want to make, how does hand even see in Adams? He doesn't have eyes. And if it is even a he, I don't know. It's just a hand. For a hand to know its full potential, it has to be connected to an arm and an arm to a shoulder, a shoulder on a body. 
And it's the same thing with you and I. We are all different parts of the body. And for us to know our full potential, to begin to grow in who God wants us to be, we need to be connected in that body. And when we're connected with other men and women, boys and girls that do things that maybe are a little different than us, what happens? We begin to discover our full potential. We begin to see what we can do. You discover your full potential when we're connected with others. We see growth in our life, uh, protection, connection. James 5.16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. We go to God for forgiveness. We go to each other for healing. When we begin to open up and you begin to let people know this is what I'm going through. You don't have to let everybody know. Don't tell everyone your secrets, but you should tell somebody your secrets. And when they begin to pray for you, what happens? Healing begins to come. I just love that we grow in our relationships. We grow in discipleship with people in our life when we begin to let people in. And that's why we emphasize relationships here, small groups. Can I challenge you this this week? If you've never been in a small group before, or maybe you were, and you're like, I didn't like them. That's okay. I read something that said, if you don't like them, they probably don't like you either. I don't know. That's just what I read. (laughs) I said, if you hate everybody, it it literally said that. If you hate everybody at work, there's a good chance they hate you too. (laughs) All right. That was for somebody. I don't know. If you've never been in a small group, maybe you did, something turned you off to it, and you're like, ah, no, it's not for me. Can I, can I challenge you this week to say, I'm, I'm going to find another group. I'm going to find a group. I'm going to go online. I'm going to find a group, and I'm going to take that step, and I'm going to get connected because Jesus said, I need discipleship. I need discipleship. And it doesn't happen just on a Sunday. It happens in the context of those groups where you get connected, get connected, and, and somebody hold... Hold each other accountable. Hold somebody accountable on that. Get connected. And here's a third. Here's the last one. This arena, I'm just calling this the inner circle. For Jesus, it was Peter, James, and John. The three. These were the closest. Can I tell you, this is probably where the most change and growth happens in our life. This can also be the most uncomfortable place to be. This could be the most challenging place Because this is where you have people in your life that love you enough that they'll tell you the truth. These are people that love you enough that they'll tell you when something's wrong. These are people who love you and believe in you that you have potential to do things better. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend how do we get sharper in life people I always you know I've heard this joke from when I was a kid in church and I've, I hear pastors say ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people I hear that all the time and I remember, I remember one time I heard a, a visiting pastor say that and I, I was a kid I just thought well if there was no people there would be no ministry that's what ministry is all about people People being sharpened, people being challenged, and people growing. And I think about Peter, James, and John, and probably of the three, Peter probably stands out the most. Peter probably one of the closest. Yet, do you realize that that Peter probably received the most correction from Jesus? What remember Peter? Like Jesus actually called Peter the devil. I mean, Jesus calls you the devil, like that is the, one of the biggest slams ever. I mean, I would be like, dang, I quit. I quit. I'm done. I mean, so if I came to one of you today and I said, Satan, get behind me, you'd go to another church. And that was Peter. But it was in that circle where Peter was challenged the most. He was challenged the most. And I was thinking, even for my, my wife and I, and I was thinking, okay, who's, who's, in our, who's some of those in our circle? And I, I thought of Pastor Christina. She's, 
She just loves our family so much. She honors my wife and I so much. And I was thinking about it the other day. She honors us so much, but there's probably no one else we challenged more than Pastor Christina. Just little tweaks, little this, little that. But you know, every time we've had to say, hey, let's do this different. Maybe we shouldn't say that. Every time, you know that I've never once gone in thinking, oh my gosh, I hope she doesn't leave the church. I hope she's not gonna get offended. We've had to sit down and we talk about things because we work together all the time. And I've always been grateful that she's always had a heart of growth in saying, yes, okay, we'll give it a shot. We'll grow. And yet she loves us and she, she honors us. And I think about this, and I, I, this is some years ago in talking about discipleship, I remember this, we need to be thick skinned disciples. If you're thin skinned, you're never gonna grow. You'll never grow in your life if you're thin-skinned because you're going to think that everybody hates you. I don't like that church. They're always bugging me. They're always correcting me. They're always on my case. They're always telling me not to say, they're always telling me, to, no, 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 I'm going to go somewhere else. You know how you go somewhere else and then they don't like you either. And then, they don't, yeah. and then again, you think everyone doesn't like you. No, wherever you go, there you are. You're the problem. Grow up. Listen. I, sometimes I want to tell people that, just listen to me. I have did that with my kids once. I remember, like, you scold. You ever had to tell your kids, like, do something, like, 20 times? And I remember one time, I just lost it. Just listen to me. It would be so much easier. Just li- I'm right. Just listen to me. And sometimes there's, there's adults in church, I just want to scream at them. Just listen to me. Stop talking to your husband like that. Stop telling your wife that. Just stop it. If you stop it, your life will be better. I promise. I don't make me tell you why. Just stop. Stop. Oh, oh let me catch my breath. There's some pent up, there's some inner healing I need, I think. I'm just. <laughs> been holding that in for (laughs) the last 29 years of ministry. (sighs) We need to be thick skin. You want to be discipled and you want actual growth, you need to have thick skin that when somebody loves you enough and they see the blind spots in your life or your marriage or your relationship, and you've given them access that they can come to you and say, hey, I think you need to stop doing this. Or I think you need to start doing that. You need to stop saying this. Don't don't tell them that you're sowing these seeds. And we have to have thick skin that we're not offended, but our hearts are open and we say, thank you. Because in my life, I have guys, I have amazing pastor friends that I've told them, if you see anything in me, tell me. I've told them, some of them don't live here. I've said, if the Lord ever, like the Holy Spirit ever tells you something about me, can you just let me know? Tell me. And they have. I've had some, just, I've had some calls and they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to offend you. Please don't take it the wrong way. And I'm already like, okay, here we go. And they tell me. But this is what I realized. They're telling me out of they have deep love for me because they want to see me be better and I receive what they say. I process what they say. And you know the end result? Is they're usually always right and I implement what they say and because of that, I become more like Jesus. I begin to act more like Jesus and I grow as a disciple because I allow people in on that inner circle. And I ask you that question today, Do you have that inner circle? Do you have people that you've given? Don't give access to everyone. Some people just want to tear you down. But you find people that you know love you, and you say, man, speak into my marriage. Speak into my life. If you see an attitude, if, if there's spinach in my teeth that I don't know about, can you please let me know? Because I look stupid to everyone else. If you will let me know, I appreciate that. What happens when we have that attitude, we grow 
we grow. Jesus corrected Peter so many times. Why? Because he saw that there were great things, there was great potential in Peter's life. And it was Peter. I, I think he knew that Acts chapter 2 was coming when it was going to be Peter who denied Christ previously, who got up in front of that group and began to preach Jesus to the multitudes. And thousands came to the Lord and the church was born on that day. If Peter didn't receive the correction that Jesus had for him prior, he would have never got up then to preach the message that he did under an anointing and a conviction that revolutionized what we're doing today. Jesus saw greater things. Are you willing to let people into your life that see greater in you and have thick skin so they can begin to speak into your life? I love, we're going to close with this verse because I love this verse. Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Isn't that such a beautiful verse? Let me read that one more time. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. If you live in a world where there's just people who are kiss, that just kiss your bottom all the time and they just tell you how great you are, get into a different world because none of us are that great. That's why, that's why celebrities are so messed up because they live in this ecosystem where there's just people continually praising them they never face reality. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. We need people in our life that we can take off the mask, people who know our secrets and love us enough to point us in the right direction so that we can grow, we can be discipled, people who will teach us how to obey so that we can be more like Jesus. And I tell you, that's where true freedom is. Amen. Won't you